So today I want to follow up from uh, the last video where we talked about functions and I want to talk about uh, graphs of functions. And that's because uh, in the last video we ended up with this idea of functions as lists um, of input-output. So for example, uh, this function, which I might write down very compactly, that, that says the input is x and the output is x squared. It says square the thing, and we saw in the last video that there can be multiple ways of implementing a function like this. Um, uh, that this sort of really becomes uh, a list of input, output, input, output, input, output. And of course there's much more, and there's in-between ones too. So for example, if I input 1.2, I want to output 1.44. Or if I input um, 1.3, I want to output 1.69. And I just can't possibly write down this entire list of inputs and outputs. Um, so it seems like this is a much better way of capturing the function, even though it's sort of uh, illicitly implying that the thing that I'm doing is squaring, when really the actual nature of the function is just this association that happens to be represented in one way by squaring. But the point of this preamble is that Graphs of functions are ways of writing down long lists like this. In fact, infinitely, infinitely long lists. Let's think about a simple example first. Let's think about a function like g of x equals x. It's a function that does nothing. It takes an input and produces the same output. So again, it's really simple to write down input-output pairs that belong on this list. 1.5, 1.5. But I'm never going to stop writing this, it's too long. But I can use a graph to capture the entire list. And the way that the graph works is I have an x-axis, which is the input. And then I have a, what's often called a y-axis, although these variables x and y are just kind of uh, conventions. But you should think of the y-axis as being the axis for outputs. So here I have... 1, 2, 3, negative 1, negative 2, negative 1, negative 2, 1, 2, 3, labeling the axes. And the point is that the fact that the input of 1 generates an output of 1 is, uh, is captured by drawing a single point, a single dot, on this two-dimensional picture here. I, I find my input, which is 1, and I go up to the output, which is also 1 in this case, and I draw a single point, and this single dot represents this element of the list. It represents the fact that an input of 1 produces an output of 1. And this says an input of 2 produces an output of 2. And an input of 1.5 produces an output of 1.5. And I'll, I also know, even though I didn't get to it in the list, an input of 3 produces an output of 3. An input of 0 0.1 produces an output of 0 0.1. And the point of this notation, this graph, is that I can actually, once I have the convention that points represent input-output pairs, I don't have to write down every, every one of the infinitely many pairs. I can just draw a single point in the plane for each pair that should exist. And what we see is we get this line, which represents the function g of x equals x by representing all the possible input-output pairs, right? 10, 10, negative 2, negative 2, and so on. Now this was a very um, simple example, so let's go back to our f of x equals x squared example. So again, we have our input axis and our output axis. And we know that this function, it's, 
is characterized by its nature is it's a list of input-output pairs. For example, when the input is 0, the output is 0. When the input is 1, let me label things a bit. When the input is 1, the output is 1. When the input is 2, the output is 4. We saw before that when the input is 1.2, the output is 1.44. When the input is 3, the output is 9, somewhere up here. Okay. Um, we can also look at negative inputs. When the input is negative 1, right, the output is 1, because negative 1 squared is um, 1. When the input is negative 2, the output is 4. So again, what's happening is that rather than writing down laboriously this long list of input-output pairs, I've condensed each such pair into a single point on the plane. And I can, if I draw, if I use a line to, with the idea that a line is drawing infinitely many points at once, then I get a visual representation of all the possible input-output pairs that agree or that make up the nature of a function. So even though you've probably all seen graphs before and they're very familiar objects to you, this is a view on what a graph is, which is very close to the, the sort of abstract mathematical nature of a function. A function is just an association between input and output, which could be expressed as an infinitely long list of pairs of numbers, but that very same idea can be expressed by a geometric shape as long as I have the right conventions that say every point on this shape corresponds to a pair. Right? This point here, which is at this level 3, corresponds to the pair square root of 3, whatever that is, 3. And every single point on this um, curve, which by the way is called a parabola, corresponds to one of the input-output pairs of this function. And this is actually one of the most beautiful things in math. Not this specifically, but the idea here is that we went from something which was very uh, clunky, very mechanistic, very just like just a list of input-output pairs, in a sense kind of algebraic. And by establishing a certain convention of how to translate numbers into points, we transform something which is algebraic or just like or something like that's a raw list, into something which is geometric, which has a shape. And this shape captures the uh, input-output relationship that this function uh, consists of. So that was uh, sort of intuition about what a graph is and what, what a graph is doing in mathematics.